thanks to everyone who helped put this event together and to all of you for being here today. Um, I'm, a, I'm a social and cultural geographer at the University of Southampton um, with a particular interest in, in off-limits and hard-to-access places. So I've spent a lot of time uh, working around issues of urban exploration, people who, who trespass into off-limit spaces. Uh, and I also have an interest in uh, what we like to call in geography more than textual methodologies, um, audio, video, and photography. And I was, um, I was giving a talk uh, about a year ago at the University of Exeter uh, about urban exploration, and I, I kind of mentioned in an offhanded way that I had been using drones to explore spaces in, spitty, in cities that, that bodies can't get to. So think of like, uh, steep sloped rooftops or central courtyards of buildings that you can't get to. And so I'd, we had been using these drones to kind of see if we could find back doors or ladders <laughs> in buildings. And one of the, um, one of the uh, uh, people in the audience there was Karen Anderson, who runs the, the drone lab at the University of Exeter. And after the talk, she, she took me to the drone lab, and, and I was amazed to see that they were, they were building these drones, and they had all sorts of different variations of drones. They had drones that could go underwater, they had drones that were um, flying in unexpected ways. And she said th this thing that really surprised me. She said, you know, no human geographer has ever come to see this drone lab. They've never been interested, right? So we, after, after talking for a while about this, we realized that there was this incredible thing going on where we have this split in geography, where you've got physical geographers that are using drones, have been using drones for a decade, very uncritically, as a tool, right? Just deploying these, as Sarah says, a sort of off, off the peg method, right? Just deploying it to whatever situation. And then we have this mountain of literature in human geography that was totally speculative, right? That was, that was all about condemning the drone as a military industrial technology, you know, almost nothing that I could find on, that was written from the lens of experience. So uh, what I'm talking about today is, is this is new research. Um, I've been working with Karen over the past year to try and use the drone as a technique to bridge uh, this, this epistemological gap right, that we found in geography. Um, so here we're trying to, uh, this is a paper that we have under review at the moment, so this is actually perfectly timed to get some feedback on, on fresh research. Um, but uh, essentially what we've got here is a, is a collaboration between a human and a physical geographer um, uh, where we're trying to bring together, you know, the practical use of this uh, technique in a way that isn't uncritical. And I hope in that sense that it's, it's continuing Sarah's theme of looking at these technologies as hopeful rather than just being kind of terrified, because they are scary, obviously, um, <laughs> in many ways. So according to Drone Life magazine, more than a million drones were sold in 2015. Uh, and the global market is expected to reach 1 billion by 2018, 1 billion US dollars. With over 1,500 different drone designs available, uh, Benjamin Wallace Wells, writing for the New York Magazine, suggests that a new taxonomy to describe the flying robot is required, one that places military and civilian drones in a different phylum, so as to sidestep the doublespeak of the drone. Yet he also suggests that the drone, an impossible word, is also a perfect one. Each of these machines gives its human operator, he writes, the same power. It allows us uh, to project our intelligence into the air and to exert our influence over vast expanses of space. So it's probably fairly obvious then why drones are of interest to geographers, right? Space and place being our, our, our remit. <laughs> um, but what Karen and I wanna, wanna argue in this paper is that um, there should be a wider interdisciplinary discussion about how our research practices are altered by the abilities and potentials of the drone. And that's what we're trying to, to sketch out here. If, as I mentioned, physical geographers have been using drones for, for some time. Um, and they have a long history of, of actually getting instrumentation airborne in various ways, including using elevated booms, uh, piloted helicopters, and kites. But it's the, it's the small size, uh, the, the inexpensive components, the ubiquitous availability, and the mobility of the drone that makes it incredibly unique as a, as a research instrument and has, has spawned a plethora of creative uses in geography. So uh, biogeographers have been scanning uh, canopy structures to quantify biomass. Volcano volcanologists have flown them into craters to sample gases. 
geomorphologists use them to quantify grain size distributions. Um, participatory and, and development geographers can deliver materials and urban geographers like myself have been sort of vaulting these barriers to bodies to explore vertical structures from rooftops to tunnels. And so in this article, we're trying to develop a drone methodology in, in the context of a, a critical human geography's vertical turn, as some people have called it, or the, or the aerial turn, synonymously with the fine-grained data revolution that's underway in physical geography. So as, whereas Pete Aidy writes that human geography seems suddenly afloat with airs and winds, fogs and aerial fluids, with volumes and verticals and objects in the air, physical geographers, uh, physical geography is entering what my co-author Karen Anderson has called a new proximal sensing era with widespread use of drones and kites. So given the range of, of uses that we're suggesting here, uh, we think that the the future of drone methodologies therefore calls for thinking not so much of the drone as an object, but as a socio-technical assemblage of the vertical within the context of geography. Now what's interesting here is that obviously airspace is a key component of that assemblage, right? And, and we were trying to think through like the space that drones occupy and actually found that it's not, it, it hasn't been defined very well. So, um, drones open out unique forms of spatial engagement in, in what we're now terming the nephosphere. The nephosphere provides a vantage point from which observations and measurements can bridge the gap in scale and resolution between ground level and satellite observations. Um, so from the Greek, nepho, cloud, and sphere, 3D object, right? It's, the term engenders a volumetric perspective that is sort of above construction cranes and below the clouds. And um, this narrow habitat, surprisingly, is often omitted from zonal classifications of the atmosphere, despite the atmospheric boundary layer being crucial for avian species and central to meteorological research. What was interesting to us is that this is sort of a part of the atmosphere that, that has been very often looked at, but not from. Right, so the drones provide that perspective for us. So the assimilation of the drones into this assemblage, we're arguing, calls for a renewed parsing of the aerial with consideration to the changing relationships between bodies, spaces, experiences, and technologies and their manifold and intersecting political and, and ethical dimensions. And uh, you know, we are gonna hear ethics come up again and again today and there's certainly a, um, a uh, very interesting conversation to have about the ethics of flying these drones around, especially in cities, right? Um, we argue that, um, that drone piloting as an experiential process changes not just what we can think, what, what we think we can do, but also how we think. So as an experience restructuring technology, we tessellate the drone as a component of an assemblage where the post-human entanglement of the operator and the drone is riddled with affect. If in flying, as Pete Aidy writes, the human operator is surrounded by the machine, is intimate with the machine, becomes the machine, reining it in, then drone methodologies call for perhaps a post-phenomenological framing following Don Ide, where technology supplies the dominant basis for both an understanding of the world and ourselves. Now, of course, I'm sure many of you are thinking, none of this is new, right? <laughs> you know, we've been looking at things from this perspective for some time, and indeed there is a history of imagery from the nephosphere uh, that begins with early pioneers who used hot air balloons in the mid-1800s, uh, followed by a period of, of experimentation with kites, where cameras uh, were attached to kites with slow-burning fuses, so that as they took the kite up, the fuse would burn down and trigger the bulb. Um, and early balloon photography, uh, which you can see here, actually captured the aftermath of the 1909 San Francisco earthquake, which you can imagine um, really twisted people's geographic imaginations, you know, being able to see things from, from this perspective. By the 1930s, the US-based radio plane company were constructing drones for military applications. And initially, these were, these were just um, cheap gunnery targets. And then um, eventually, they started attaching cameras to them and using them for reconnaissance. The first uh, lightweight consumer grade multi-rotor, which was called the Roswell Flyer, came onto the market in 1999. Um, 
At $350 US dollars, this became the de facto platform for hobbyists who were quick to modify the frames and components, kickstarting a maker movement and online community for grassroots enthusiasts. Thus, the drone, as a device central to the history of aerial survey, has always been at least three things a tool of military engagement, a research instrument, and a popular platform for experimentation. And although there's a clear history of sensing from this proximal bird's eye view, what contemporary drones uh, introduce is an extraordinary mobility within the nephosphere. Now, you may have noticed um, <laughs> that I keep saying sensing rather than seeing from the nephosphere, right? And that's very intentional. The drone is defined as much as a technology that can see as a technology that flies, yet seeing is just one part of how they sense. The aerial gaze is many. It's multiplied and situated in different contexts. It's also a vision that's practiced and touched. It's not simply ocular or visual, but an assembly of practices and materials. Alexander von Humboldt's uh, early 19th century work on the telescope, I think, actually provides a useful analog here where he refers to the telescope as an organ of sensuous contemplation, which forever changes our perception of the cosmos. In other words, the telescope allowed us to see more and see differently, and as a result, transformed our view of the universe and our place in it, in much the same way that drones are offering modern researchers. Uh, Harriet Hawkins and I have written that um, the POV camera is a sort of uh, grafting of bodies and technologies, where the viewing of footage acts as a sort of cranial transplant, eye to eye, brain to brain. And even more in, a, in, in an even more visceral way, head goggles with FPV, first person view, as you're seeing here, um, allow the drone pilot to fly so that as Wallace Wells writes, what you feel is not displacement, but extension. Uh, he, he writes about this um, drone pilot that he's observing in the goggles, and he says that when the pilot takes the goggles off, his hands were visibly, visibly trembling. He quakes, he said, because the experience was so overwhelming. And there, there are countless vertiginous YouTube videos, which I won't subject you to here, of um, drone races and people racing drones through abandoned buildings and flying through pipes and things that are, that, that, um, are an indication of how the senses are kind of melding with these new technologies to create new ways of interacting with environments that have never been possible before. And I think that is interesting in and of itself, um, even in just the most basic sense of like wanting to go out and do ethnographic work with these people and say, well, you know, what does this mean that you can move through a building in this way? So, um, so the technical capacities of the drone are sort of blending those remote sensing technologies into what we're arguing is something far more proximal. But, uh, what the drone can do, right, the way, the way that the drone senses is also changing rapidly. So this is happening both through sense and avoid technology. This is the same technology that's going into driverless cars where you can sort of send the drone into a, a, a pipe underground and it won't hit anything because all the sensors will keep it from bouncing off walls. But also through um, structure from motion imaging, SFM imaging. So uh, this, is a, this is a really bad rendition of this incredible 3D image that was created by a drone of the Christ the Redeemer statue in Rio de Janeiro. And what, what happened here is that terrestrial laser scanners that would have worked on the ground uh, were, weren't able to get, sort of scan the top of this statue. And, um, and if you were to try and survey this from the air, you wouldn't be able to sort of capture uh, the statue in a way that would be totally volumetric. So, so what they did is they, they flew drones around the statue and sort of um, took tens of thousands of photos of the statue, and then from that we're able to reference it through, through this F SFM software into a 3D model. So what we're saying here is that here you can see a grounded example, a research grounded example of human geography's interest in the vertical and the volumetric, and an example of how drone technology allows us to, to sense, create, archive, and share in different ways. And you can imagine how useful this technology would be in, for instance, war zones where heritage monuments are, are being destroyed and disappeared, right? You can send the drones in to rapidly, especially with drone swarms, uh, which totally depend on this sense and avoid technology, you can send in the swarm to sort of capture this data before it disappears and get them out of there. Um, 
the other thing that, that interests me as an urban explorer is that uh, hardware innovations uh, are, are changing what drones can do and where they can go. So I, I mentioned um, this sense and avoid technology, but also consider the exploratory potential of, of drones encased in cages that protect their blades and bodies. These design modifications allow underground territories and resources to be explored or could potentially assist trapped miners bringing food and water so they could assist in rescue operations. Um, or of course, you know, in, in, in my experience, they could be used to explore spaces in, in cities, right? Think about uh, the infrastructures of cities, sewer networks, electricity, tunnels, uh, 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 metro systems, you know, these are spaces that can be explored through this drone technology. And I think importantly, is available to people who are um, unwilling or unable to climb urban heights and plums urban depths. Now, there's a, there's a great story that we found in doing research for this article about uh, someone who is in a wheelchair and had never actually been upstairs in their in their two-story house. And so he got this VR headset and was able to fly the drone up there and actually see the upstairs, even if it not seen before. So flight technology, as I mentioned at the beginning, is also changing as rapidly as sensing technology. Jordan Crandall has referred to the drone as a winged fusion of flying beast and machine. And this is most evident in drone designs inspired by the physiology of birds, where ornithopters simulate flapping wings or flotational airbursts emulate jellyfish motion. Okay. There are also slightly more disturbing projects that have fitted uh, microprocessors, batteries, and radio receivers to living insects to allow external flight control. Um, and you know, this cyborg instinct, uh, uh, insect, perhaps a variant of Haraway's hybrid creature composed of organism and machine, can be then flown using oscillating electrical pulses that control thrust and lift. So these creatures should be seen as, as um, the out, an outcome of, of social rather than technological conditions and prompt consideration of what Sarah Whatmore describes as the increasingly porous boundaries between human, animal, and machine. Like all technologies of surveillance, drones can be detourned and wielded as surveillance tools. So where surveillance can be translated to mean watching from above, surveillance contra this is about watching from below. Uh, consider that protesters have used drone footage to back up their claims to unjust arrest. PETA has used drones to monitor hunters. And in 2012, images inadvertently captured by a drone prompted an investigation into a Dallas area, era, area meatpacking plant that appeared to be dumping pig blood into a nearby river, and that actually led to prosecution. So in support of just such interventions, Australia has taken a more nuanced approach to regulation, protecting drone surveillance where the productive, though legally dubious use of drones has prevented greater crimes from happening. We also see this happening in the US and the UK where restrictions are tighter. In California, one man operates a, citizen's, a flying citizen's patrol and he films police as they pull people, people over to curb abuses. And the UK, the social justice collective Immigrant X has used drones to, stop and, uh, to disrupt stop and search operations by border forces. Sticking with the, the subversive potential of drones, the graffiti artist Kotsu uh, developed a remote trigger for a drone that carried a can of spray paint, which he used to deface one of the largest billboards in New York City, a statement on the commercial dominance of cityscapes. Proximal aerial motility, mobility has the capacity to render investment in CCTV gates, fences, and guards farcical, and hence the drone fol following Nigel Thrift speaks back into the all-encompassing ambitions of the security entertainment complex in unexpected ways from which it's possible to learn new associative open ends. Proof enough of the validity of Walter Benjamin's thesis that technology, today used for death-dealing purposes, may eventually recover its emancipating potential and readopt the playful aesthetic aberrations that secretly inspire it. For instance, I've um, been working with drones recently uh, in regards to land activism, I was contacted by some land activists who were um, uh, wanted to put this huge chalk drawing just near Heathrow um, on a piece of land that was going to be given away to the Queen's Park Rangers Football Club by the local council, literally given away. This is public land. 
And so they went out at uh, five in the morning before dark, before sunrise, and painted this thing. And they asked me to um, bring the drone so that we could share this image more widely, right? So, so you know, what was a great idea in the context of like planes landing at Heathrow seeing this image uh, ended up actually going much more viral because of the drone footage, right? So the drone here as a tool that induces fear and suspicion and dread in other contexts instead becomes a tool for opening out possibilities for critical engagement. Rising back into the contested nephosphere, subversive uses of consumer drones have resulted in um, changes to legislation. Um, probably most well known are the, the two separate incidences of, of uh, drones landing on the White House lawn um, a couple of years ago, which prompted uh, DJI, one of the largest drone manufacturers, to impose mandatory geofences around um, military installations and in fact around 13% of Washington DC, you know, can't fly over. <clears throat> and these geofences um, mean that if you buy into closed source drone technology, uh, your aircraft isn't wholly within your control. Its operations can be restricted by geopolitical forces operating at national and international levels. And the geofences, which are undoubtedly going to expand in coming years, like so many regulatory and surveillance technologies, are extremely limited in what you can actually do. Um, so this is, a, this is an image from Iceland. I was just there with uh, Adam Fish from the University of Lancaster. And we were, um, we were flying over the Bitcoin servers next to Reykjavik Airport. And we, we actually smashed into the geofence, um, which is really disconcerting when the drone sort of stops and will not move anymore. And it almost feels like a net, the way it bounces out of it. And then we thought we were gonna crash and we didn't. And so we started kind of moving the drone down, coming lower, and we found that we could actually go under the net. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, so these, these things are limited, right? Like any technology. So, you know, a lot of people suggest that with increasing regulation and with the, these hardware and firmware impositions that the kind of Wild West moment of the drone is over. And one of the things that we say as pilots is this is definitely not the case. Um, these technologies can be hacked and, you know, flying a drone is about as wild as it gets. Uh, very often when we, after a flight, we find ourselves like sweaty and, and, um, and, and exhausted. It's emotionally exhausting. So. I'm going to finish here with some more footage from my uh, recent work with Adam tracing undersea communication networks with drones and suggest that in working out the potentials and pitfalls of drone methodologies, experience is the linchpin. If phenomenological accounts of air give the sense of immersion in a volume that is qualitatively different to the recent volumetric accounts of territory and verticality, the drone is, we argue, a powerful political proposition. To date, the light the, the lightweight drone has been deployed to its greatest effect as a platform for proximal sensing and physical geography. However, Karen and I really want to suggest here a potential for the drone as more than an empirical tool. Embodied understandings and, uh, uh, and, and of the capacities and limitations of drone technology requires participation, but none of these technologies obviously should be critically unwielded. So in conclusion here, what we're calling for is researchers in the humanities and social sciences to discuss together, to fly together, and to imagine together so that these frontiers can be explored. Thanks very much. So we've I got, know, it's wild, isn't it? Yeah, this, my head is exploding and it's only 11 a.m. Um, a couple of questions. We've got time for a couple of questions. Shall I? Sarah's got a question. I've got questions. Um, I find it really curious. Um, I thought the paper was, I thought it was a fantastic talk to start with, but um, one of the, the things that I found, and, yeah, I won't really go on about those things that were interesting I was to the question. Um, I was curious about why you used the term piloting for, um, and, and if that comes from drone culture or if it's something you put into it yourself. Um, I, I think that the reason why we want to hold on to that term is because 
this kind of notion of the drone as an autonomous vehicle is so wrong. <laughs> it's they're really hard to fly, um, and they're dangerous, you know. And so when, when you're flying a drone, it really is, you know, it, it doesn't matter how much sense and avoid technology you put in there. We've learned this from driverless cars too, right? Like crazy things still happen, and um, hardware failures happen all the time. I've, I lost one drone. Um, because one of the one of the motors burned out, and it just you know it just flew off, and luckily we were in Wales and it crashed into a field full of sheep instead of like in the middle of the city. But I had this this really interesting moment. Well, it was actually oh no, I was with Adam flying over the Bitcoin servers, and we hit the geofence, and the drone sort of we thought you know there was a kind of warbly moment. We thought it was going to come down or something, and he turned to me and he said, "These things aren't really ready, are they?" You know, we're like you know, so it really feels as you say like. A process of experimentation, and we are learning how to use these things as the technology is emerging. And I think it's actually really important that we do that, and that we continue to hold on to this notion of like, um, you know, piloting being a process of, of experimentation, right? And acknowledging that like we are actually in control of this technology, that we can hack it, we're in control of what it can do, and that there's an, an ethical responsibility there, but also I think more importantly, an opportunity to kind of shape what the technology becomes. And that's even more interesting, right? Does that answer? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Um, you mentioned <clears throat> very briefly the, the connection with driverless cars, and I'm interested in that connection as well. And in particular, the, the similarities and differences in terms of the way that the camera works and the visual data processing, uh, do you see that, I guess, yeah, my question is, is, do you see that connection as to do with the body of the user, the driver, or um, the pilot, or to do with the technology itself, the visual processing technologies, or the sensing technologies? Yeah, I, th I mean, this is so fascinating in the context of thinking about the notion of the assemblage, right? You know, the, the, the body of the human and the body of the machine and the environment that it's interacting with because you've got, you know, the, the, the prob this last, the, I guess the most famous crash with um, driverless cars was this, this Tesla vehicle that crashed because of a reflection that it didn't see. Um, and so you've got sensors there failing and of course you get those with drones as well. Like, um, Karen is really the expert on how the sensors work, which is why it was great to write with her. She could do all the technical stuff, you know, and I can just talk about phenomenology. But, um, uh, but the, you know, the, the sensors effectively work the same way, right? They're, they're bouncing off of something, and they have, to, they have to bounce back for the drone to know that there's something there. Well, what happens when it's like flying through tree branches, right? And, and the sensor's kind of bouncing and kind of not, and it gets, you know... So there's kind of, there seems to be a kind of assumption that you're going to be flying or driving the car in particular kinds of environments, right? And um, that's one way that these sensors kind of fail. But I think even more importantly, the way that they fail is because people will hack them, right? And turn the sensors off and not trust the technology, right? This is human nature when, when the, you know, you, you program in the flight plan and you send the drone out and you want to get this very specific, like, shot of video as it comes around something. And then you realize that there's a light pole and you're not quite sure how high that light pole is because you know, your perspective is off from that distance. And you, you do it, you grab the controller and you're like, no, no, I'm, not, I'm canceling the flight plan and you take over, right? And that's when you crash the thing. <laughs> so I think you know, those are all things that we have to work through, but this is, this is also why we say that it's really important that, you know, why we say experience is the linchpin here. We've got to go out and fly these things, understand how all this stuff works. We've got to crash them and destroy them Things need to get broken. You know that's how we're gonna. That's how we're gonna uh, figure out what these tools can do, and you know try and, and figure out what the potentials and pitfalls are. Yeah, g'day, Bradley. Uh, great talk. Thank you very much. Um, where are you? Where are you? You uh, referenced the oh. fun layer of the atmosphere uh, above the uh, cranes, but below the crowds. Yeah. What was that? The mesosphere or mesosphere? The nephosphere. So, so fr it's from the Greek. So, nep nepho is Greek for cloud. So, and any the, Hmm? N -E -F. How do you spell it? <laughs> Nef N N E P H O S. Nephosphere. Nephosphere, yeah. Nephosphere. 
Yeah, I, it was really strange because we sort of we went back to like this old geography literature, like Alexander von Humboldt. You know, we're digging through all these kind of like zonal classifications, and we and we couldn't find this place. <laughs> you know, so I, we got to the point we asked so many people, and everyone said, "No, we don't think there's a name for that." So we just had to make one up, um, and maybe it's not quite right, but I don't know. But I, I, we'll find out when we get the reviews back. But I'd be really interested in talking about like how we define this because it seems to us it's going to be an increasingly important space. Um, and particularly if you think about like the way, so the FAA in, in the US and um, the CAA in the UK, I'm sure there's a, there's a similar authority here that is kind of defining how airspace is used. Traditionally their remit has been um, where airplanes go, obviously. And suddenly they're overwhelmed with the um, necessity of having to dice out the nephosphere, right? And decide where like commercial drones are gonna go, where consumer drones are gonna go, and they're actually creating air lanes. And I think this is really fascinating. We write about it in the paper that it's very similar to what happened with, with shipping lanes, right? Hundreds of years ago where suddenly they had, you know, they had to think, well, there's all this shipping going on now. We need to kind of regulate who's going where. Um, and uh, one of the things that we argue is like, you know, I'm sure at the time everyone decried that and said, oh, this is the end of the, you know, the, the days, days of the high seas and pirates and whatever. And of course it, it wasn't. You know. <laughs> Sorry, um, in the interest of us all being able to have lunch. Absolutely. I'm going to stop the session there, uh, but please catch up with Brad afterwards. And I think Larissa's up next. <laughs>